All right, it looks like our participant count is holding steady, so we will start our presentation for the evening. Good evening and welcome to our latest science speaker series lecture. I'm Sam at the Mariah Mitchell Association, and I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'd first like to start by thanking our sponsors of the science speaker series, which include Bank of America, Cape Air, The White Elephant, and Cisco Brewers. Tonight, we have a very special presentation by our very own MMA research associate, Dr. Val Hall. A little bit about Val. In 1976, she was hired to teach science at Nantucket High School, and she earned her master's degree in marine biology from Boston University in 1984. After she retired in 2004, Val joined the MMA Scallop Project. She then began a graduate program in oceanography at the University of Massachusetts using several summers of Bay Scallop research in Nantucket Harbor as her dissertation topic. Val was appointed an MMA research associate in 2006, and she was awarded her PhD in 2014. For this special presentation tonight, Val will be joined by eight of her students for an overview of their Nantucket Bay Scallop research and summer laboratory experience. These students participate in all aspects of Val's ongoing research, as well as design and carry out their own projects while enhancing their research, written and oral presentation skills. As far as logistics for tonight's event, we do have our Q&A open at the bottom as always. We encourage you to submit your questions all throughout the presentation. Since we have so many presenters tonight, if you have questions for a specific student, um, I'd love you to write their name in that when you, when you type in the question, but otherwise we'll try our best to direct it to the right person. Um, and thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Val uh, for this very exciting presentation. Can you from here? Yes, I can. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, Perfect. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and pleased to have my students with me, too. Um, and this is the sixth summer that uh, the Scallop Research and Mentoring Program has been uh, here at the Mariah Mitchell Association. And it started with five students that had just finished the eighth grade oceanography program at uh, Cyrus Pierce Middle School here on the island. And now it has blossomed to be 18 students at all. And I have half of them with me tonight. The other half have, have already done their presentation live at the Great Harbor Yacht Club, which is one of our major sponsors along with the Nantucket Shellfish Association and super amount of support from Mariah Mitchell Association, uh, including a lab to work in and all sorts of other assistance uh, and from the families of the Qureshis and the Sokols. So I'd like to start by showing you that group of wonderful 18 uh, students uh, with the research assistants in the middle uh, and the volunteers on either side. And it's just been such a pleasure to work with these folks. And the people on the bottom are the people that are actually presenting here uh, for you tonight. Uh, but first of all, I need to start with this incredible animal. It's my favorite animal, uh, this beautiful blue-eyed base skull of Argopectin radians. And it is just an amazing creature and I'll never know enough about it. Uh, and I, we are lucky to be in an area where we have them still. Uh, they, we have the perfect conditions for base scallops. We have a shallow protected harbor and Natiket is another uh, harbor that it uh, lives in. Uh, it has eelgrass, which is one kind of seagrass, and it has sandy sediments because it doesn't like mud and it doesn't like rocky environment. However, uh, most places along its former range, which is along the whole Atlantic coast of uh, the United States, even up into Canada, and then around Florida and into the Gulf Coast and all the way to Texas, have, have now, are now devoid of scallops, uh, both because of habitat loss uh, human uh, caused problems like pollution, uh, pollution, but also in some cases overfishing. But now what I'd like to do to have uh, the students continue telling you about the base scallop. And the first person that's going to speak is Maddie Iller. And she's going to tell you about the base scallop's life cycle, its reproduction and its spawning periods. Uh, and from that, uh, how nub scallops come about and what they are if you haven't heard about them. Uh, Maddie was born and raised here on the island, and her mother was one of my students back in the day. And um, she graduated from Nantucket High School, and now she's entering her freshman year at George Washington University. In fact, she already is there. She's sitting in her dorm right now. Uh, she has spent three years in the program, 
and has served as a substitute research assistant when needed this summer. So it's all yours, Maddie. Thanks, Val. <laughs> Um, if you don't mind moving on to the next slide, I'd love to tell you about the base scallop before we talk about what we do with the base scallop. So first we'll talk about the scallop's life cycle. And it's very basic when, you know, when the water temperature is right around 65 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the sperm and eggs at different times um, with a single spawning event will, you, will release and they can do it several times and go switch back and forth between the sexual products. And then quite shortly after that, almost within 40 to 50 minutes after fertilization, they become larval and they float through the air, uh, or no, sorry, not the air, the water. Um, and, you know, shortly after that, like 17 to 48 hours, um, but when the temperature is usually around, like usually it tends, tends to be a bit warmer, um, those turn into a swimming and feeding stage and it will be the first time they'll be feeding. And then shortly after that, um, they'll be swimming around and growing. And eventually they will find their way to a eelgrass plant where they'll connect and they'll stay. And staying on the eelgrass plant really is the best habitat for them because it provides a substrate and slower flow field. So the larvae can attach and they also can stay away from predators. And then when they're get, they finally get big enough and become, turn into juvenile scallops, they'll fall into the seafloor and that's where they'll become adult scallops. And they'll typically live between 12 and 24 months and they'll spawn once and occasionally twice throughout their lifetime. And yeah, they could be harvested in the fall. Um, sorry, I got my page here. So the overall biology of the white scallop, I mean, of the base scallop, we tend to focus on the gonad. Um, so the gonad is split into two parts, the testes and the ovary. And the testes is more of the cream colored and the ovary tends to be arranged between pink to orange, depending on how um, full and fertilized it is and ready for reproduction. Um, so when the scallop spawns, the sperm is released first and that stimulates the ovaries to release their eggs. And um, this is the way that to prevent self sort of, sort of oh my gosh, I can't talk, I'm sorry. Self certified, sort of, I can't say it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but a single scallop can release up to 2 million eggs, but it has a very, um, very slim survival rate. And I think only like a handful of scallops survive out of those 2 million eggs and during one spawning event. And occasionally they can spawn a second time after a year. And thank you. Um, so in the B, there's two different spawning periods, the early spawn and the late spawn, and also in different areas. So the Northeast tend to have more of an early spawn and the Southeast tend to have a later spawn. But anyways, the, the gonads will start to be like, they'll start, they'll begin to mature around like May and then they'll slowly begin to reproduce in July. And then during the late spawn, it'll be more towards July and August or September and October and occasionally up to November. It all just tend, depends on the temperature of the water and how ready they are. And we do have two different types of scallops. Um, one of them is the classic nub and another one is, I mean, excuse me. Um, one of them is the classic scallop and one of them is the nub scallop. And um, the first spawn is usually, it tends to be the classic scallop because they have more time to have growth rings and more time to grow before the winter months where they grow slower. And when the scallops spawn more towards the fall, they tend to not grow as much throughout the winter and those are nub scallops. And there's distinct growth ring that we can see uh, as we collect them. And nubs are often spawn in summers, but unlike the classics, they usually die in the early second summer. Eric, thank you very much, Maddie. And you probably have to go pretty soon, but <laughs> uh, it's great to see you. Um, Alex Almeida is a junior at the Middlesex School in Concord, Mass, and lives in New Canaan, Connecticut. And he's going to tell us about the major predators of larval and young base scallops. Alex? All right. <clears throat> so young base scallops are especially susceptible 
to predators. And that's for three major reasons. Their size, the brittleness of their shell, and their like inability to close their valve entirely. And there's two major predators to young base gallops, the comb jellies on the slide and the mud crab. And comb jellies will feed on larval base gallops and they feed basically by filter feeding plank planktonic sized scallops and mud crabs will feed by just crushing the shells of a little little older scallops than the comb jellies will eat and there's other predators um, namely like parasites disease and stuff like that and one of the big ones is the polyshate worm which will attach itself and feed on very young scallops and as the scallop grows and the shell develops they'll create little holes in the shell and they'll expose the organs to the water and all the other things in the water that can be bad for it that's about all i have val thank you that's great um we're next going to hear from louise calder and she is a entering her freshman year at Meridian World School, which is in Round Rock, Texas. So she's come a long way. And she's gonna describe the major predators of adult bay scallops. Um, so first of all, the, the way that the adult bay scallops is, get away from the predators is they like clap their shells together and it, it pushes them through the water and they just go a little bit away and go back down into the sand. Um, and their, their major predators are whelks, which is like an, another shellfish, or not a shellfish, um, another shell animal. Green crabs, which are an invasive species um, and which someone on Nantucket, I forgot who is trying to combat right now. Um, Cownos rays, which eat uh, a lot of shellfish, including scallops, sea stars, blue crabs and gulls. And then like the, the younger ones, they're also susceptible to parasites and disease such as um, pea crabs, which I think a later slide talks about, but basically they're crabs that go into the, the scallop shell and um, live there and eat their food. And uh, we did some statistics on that this year that again, I think are later in the presentation, but um. Yeah. Thank you, Louise. Uh, our next speaker is Evie Scarlett, and she's another island native, and she's a senior at Nantucket High School, and she's going to describe some of the Bay Scallops' defenses against predators. Um, so Bay Scallops have a couple of ways that they can protect themselves from predators. First, they have really tiny sensory eyes and tentacles that can help them see and feel where they are so they have an idea of what's going on around them. Um, they also have a hard shell which protects them from some physical um, attacks from predators and their shells are also usually brown and gray which camouflages pretty well with the environment that they live in. Um, they can also grow seaweed or like barnacles or other small things on them, which also helps them camouflage when they are burying themselves um, in the sand. And they also can swim um, pretty well. So they can like get away from predators, especially slow predators that can't really travel um, very fast or follow them very far. So they can um, they do have a chance to escape and hide. Thank you, Evie. Um, now I'd like to introduce Derek Sokol, who's a sophomore at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. And he's been in this research program for the last three years. And this summer he's been serving as my research assistant. And he'll describe the major risks to bay scallops and their importance to this island. Uh, and then he will give an overview of the entire research program. Eric? Yeah, so there are many variables that are required for the successful spawn of base scallops, a few of which could be prevented if there were to be more restrictions and just like general environmental monitoring. The damaging effects of climate change and pollution trickle down and hurt many different parts of marine life, especially in coastal areas such as Nantucket. 
However, there are also other concerning activities that are damaging the species reproductive rate that can be more easily managed on the local level, such as regulating how boats dredge in order to protect the eelgrass environments, which are vital to the bay scallops. Other factors that endanger the species that could more reasonably be monitored are the invasive green crabs, which was mentioned before, and the management of harmful uh, algal blooms. My personal belief is that if the local government of Nantucket were to enact some more of these regulations, then these issues could be managed. However, climate change and pollution need to be solved, obviously, on a much larger scale. And so the reason why we need to be more aware and responsive to these issues is due to the integral role the Bay Scallop plays in Nantucket. Next slide, please. So surprising to many is that besides some coastal areas of Florida, Nantucket is one of the only areas in the world that hosts healthy wild Bay Scallops. The market for Bay Scallops and their economic importance in the island is also huge. I'm sure you've all frequented the many restaurants in Nantucket and have seen scallops on pretty much every menu. Losing the base scallops when it is preventable to do so would hurt the restaurants and the commercial fishermen whose livelihood depends on them. It would be quite the disgrace to lose such a classic New England delicacy due to our own negligence. And besides our own enjoyment of the scallops, they also indicate a healthy and thriving marine environment. Because there are so many different variables that are required for their continued reproductive success, when they are present in an ecosystem, the system itself can reasonably be assumed to be healthy. And also the marine food web, which is incredibly complex, uh, in which scallops hold a very important role. Scallops are important in the food chain as they consume microscopic organisms and zooplankton, and they are consumed by many animals such as crabs, sea stars, and rays. Next slide, please. So as I have been a part of this program for about three years now, I can speak towards how well it allows students of all ages to immerse themselves in a real research study. The lab, which stays open for more than three months each summer, allows middle school, high school, and college students to learn about field research and microscopy. Students learn and master all stages of scallop reproductive histology from collecting and dissecting the processing and embedding to sectioning and staining, and finally actually evaluating these prepared slides under the microscope. Although at first the process can be a little intimidating as there are a lot of steps and chemicals and some pretty sharp blades, Dr. Hall does a fantastic job of teaching each student from scratch how to incorporate themselves productively in the lab. And a large part of its success in teaching young students histological techniques is uh, the lab notebook in which each student logs their daily work and observations. And besides working with these scallops in the lab, we also go on seven, seven different collecting trips with the well-known Nantucket native Captain Carl. And those are great as I'm sure each student can attest to. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Derek, that's great. Um, I would like to uh, introduce Alex again, you met him already, and he's going to describe what it is like to go out collecting with our Captain Carl. And so the collecting trips were definitely a highlight of my experience in my work with the Maria Mitchell Association. And I was actually lucky enough for my first day and in my introduction to the program to be able to wake up on a nice sunny morning and have a quick five minute orientation with Val outside of her car and then hop on the boat and meet a few people. And so the purpose of these collecting trips was to collect around 60 scallops for later study. And we would do this by collecting 15 scallops from each area, measuring the water temperature at the surface and at the bottom. And the scallops were brought onto the boat you can see the dredge in the middle picture, and that would be dragged along the bottom and the boat would just troll for scallops. And I think we can go to the next page. 
And I think I can just sum up the my journal entry of the first day was it was a fun introduction to the program. I got to meet a few people who I'd be working with and a lot of cool stories from Carl. So. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, Kay Lyon uh, is a junior at the Kent, uh, Kent Place School in Summit, New Jersey, and lives in New Vernon, New Jersey. And she's going to explain what we do with all those scallops that were collected the very day after we have done so. So on those collecting trips, we usually get about 60 scallops. We uh, place them in the fridge overnight and the next morning we go into the lab to uh, open them, dissect them and measure various characteristics of them. Um, typically, if you were on the collecting trip the day before, you would go in and get to process the scallops that you had just collected previ the previous day. So what we uh, really look for are the types and age of the scallops. We measure the three dimensions of the scallops and uh, then we do um, a bunch of work with the uh, organs inside of them. So to determine their type and age, what we typically do is we examine the outside of their shell. Um, you can tell by where the growth rings are, whether they're a classic or a nub scallop. And then from then we measure, we can count how many growth rings there are to determine if they're one year old or two years old. Um, from then we measure all um, dimensions of the shells and then we go ahead and shuck them open. Uh, once we have the inside of the scallop exposed, we then uh, take out the organs, the muscles and especially the gonads and weigh all of them. Um, we record that way, then we go ahead and dissect the gonads or the reproductive organ from the rest of the body. We discard the shells and uh, the rest of it. I mean, we all love to eat the mussels, but after sitting in the fridge over one night, they're probably not the best to eat. Um, so those go and, go and be discarded as well. We then uh, measure the weight of the gonads. We also um, scale sorry, rate the colors of each gonad on a scale of one to five. One is a very pale orange. This is usually a, this is usually a sign that the gonad itself is not very ripe and is not preparing to reproduce. And a five is a very deep to red orange. You can see an example of that in one of the pictures on the slide. And that seems to be a uh, scallop that is preparing to reproduce. Um, once we get the weight of either the whole, with both the whole body and the gonad itself, we can then calculate the GSI, which will be talked about in uh, a next slide. And then we take labels and sew them onto the gonads themselves, and then place them in formalin, a preserving chemical for 24 hours. And here are just more pictures of us dissecting and going through the various stages of the dissection, opening, and recording process. Oh, thank you, Kate. So I would now like to introduce Faison Qureshi. He's a five-year veteran of this research program. He started when he was what, 11, 12, I can't remember what he told me, but uh, he lives in Lincoln, Mass, and he'll start his junior year at the Moses Brown School in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, he's going to explain some of the analysis that can be done with our data that, that we collect, including some that he has done with some statistics. Um, and he did that on the effect of temperature on the reproductive capacity or GSI. And it also he's going to talk about a little about an ongoing project that we've been doing on the effect of pea crab parasitism on base scallop reproduction, which uh, right now we have a paper from uh, people working the previous year um, that is hopefully going to be published soon. So Faison? Thank you, Val. Um, so during our research trips and the actual dissecting of the specimen, a hypothesis rose regarding the relation between water temperature and the GSI. Uh, GSI stands for gonadosomatic index. Um, and so what is GSI? Uh, the gonadosomatic index is the ratio of the weight of the reproductive organ compared to the weight of the scallop's body. And uh, that uh, weight of the body does not include the shell of the scallop. 
So the GSI can be used to indicate how fertile a scallop is because the higher the GSI, the heavier the gonad is in relation to the body. Um, therefore, the more fertile the, the gonad is. Uh, Val Kiyun, thank you. Uh, so for this analysis, we will be using five collection dates starting on June 8th and ending August 2nd. A consistent scallop type first year classic C1s will be used. Uh, we've collected a total of 244 C1 scallops uh, through this uh, collect, um, through these collecting trips. And the average GSI has been calculated for each collecting trip. Uh, Val, next slide, please. So looking at the same data on um, the same data on a graph, the common theme is the higher the water temperature, the lower infertility, suggesting an inverse proportional relationship. Using a line of linear regression or the best fit line, we can conclude that an increase in temperature by one degree Celsius will give a decrease in 1.16% GSI. So in more simple terms, the warmer the water, the less fertile the scallop is. One can imagine with global temperature rising, how drastic its effect on scallop reproduction would be. Uh, pea crab, so moving on to uh, the pea crab um, parasite part. Uh, Val, can you go back to the, sorry. So pea crabs have been very prevalent during our collection and dissection. From this small sample set of 23 scallops, six scallops had pea crabs. The average GSI of a scallop without pea crabs was 15% versus a 12.9% GSI average in scalps with pea crabs. Other than GSI, we can use the color scale to determine fertility. The average color for the scalps without pea crabs is 2.6 versus a two color scale average for scalps with pea crabs. There's a clear difference in the fertility levels between scalps with and without pea crabs. Uh, so there's a reduction in the fecund, uh, fecundity of the scalp with pea crabs. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. And there's just some information about pea crabs if you're interested and what they look like and just how big they can get when the female gets full of eggs and she just becomes more and more uh, damaging to a scallop's reproductive system. So now Derek, who you met before, uh, is going to talk about how we process the preserved scallop gonads and get into cassettes and then getting them ready to, for further histology. Yeah, so after the initial post field observations and dissections, the scallop cannot immediately be cut for a microscope, microscope slide. So instead, the tissue has to be processed and prepared for that step. The processing involves three different types of solutions alcohol solutions, slide bright solutions, and paraffin solutions. And it can take a, a couple days. And while we process, we have to switch the labeled gonads between these different jars, which hold different solutions inside of an incubator. And once the gonad itself has been prepared and it's completely processed, a very thin cross section is made, which we then put into a little plastic histocassette. Thank you, Derek. Now, Louise, will explain that process of embedding the gonad slices into paraffin and to produce the blocks that will then be used for sectioning. So um, there's this, this big machine uh, called an embedder um, in the lab. And basically what you do is you, after you put it, after you embed it in the, or after you get the specimen and you put it in the histocassette, you put it in like the, um, paraffin and then you take some of them out of the paraffin and you put them in this little container in the embedder and then you take them out you take off uh, the top fill the bottom with like or no 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 there's the there's this like metal boat thing too you fill a, a little bit of that with paraffin it's you can see it right on the picture that is, it's not the, the furthest right, but second furthest. The, you fill it with a little bit of wax, you take the specimen out from the bottom of the histocassette, you put it in, and then you put the bottom of the histocassette on it, uh, and it acts as a label, and then you fill it all the way up with paraffin. And then you slide it over onto this, like, cool plate, and it just stays there until 
it's set enough that you can put it, we can put it on um, a plastic tray and then transfer it to the, the freezer where it kind of depends how long it stays there. Sometimes we had to leave them overnight. Sometimes it was just like maybe an hour or so, but then uh, you take it out and use a razor blade to, or first you pop it out of the, the boat, which you, most of the time, honestly, if you didn't leave it in there like overnight, it would result in the thing popping out and you'd have to do it all over again. But then you, um, yeah, so you, you, you take it out and then you use a razor blade to cut it into like much smaller squares so that it's mostly just the specimen surrounded by a little bit of paraffin. Um, and then yeah, and if it pops out at any point in the process, then you simply put the entire thing back into the, the little hot container and it melts the paraffin again and you just do it over again. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good that it's forgiving like that. You continue to do that. Uh, Evie will now take the reins and explain how we then section the paraffin blocks with the microtome. So the sectioning is we take the block that um, we would have made on the last slide and we try and get really tiny thin slices um, on a ribbon so that we can put them on a slide and look at them under the microscope after they've been stained. So to start, we put the block into the chalk, which is the little metal part that holds the block. Um, and we put a sharp disposable blade into the blade holder and we angle it so that it will not cut off the whole specimen and just like make a little tiny slice. And then we rotate the handle on the side of the microtone um, and it will move the block towards the blade and also up and down. It moves it about eight micrometers. So that's just like very, very, very tiny. Um, at a time. And this way, when it hits the blade, it will just make a really tiny, thin um, slice. And as we keep rotating it, it just makes more slices and they connect, the paraffin like connects and it makes a ribbon. Um, so once we have a ribbon, we transfer it to the um, warm water bath. Um, and we want, we do that a few more times until we get at least two good ribbons where we can see the specimen in it. And then we would take the, um, the slide and we put it underneath the paraffin and we pick it up so that we get it on the slide so you can see on the bottom picture where we see all the slides on the slide warmer. Um, and we leave those there overnight. We wanna make sure we have at least two of every specimen and then the next day we come back and we label the, the slides so we can keep track of which is which. Um, we choose one of the two to stain and then we would begin staining them so that we can then look at them under the microscope. Thank you, Evie. Uh, in fact, Kay is going to describe that process of staining the resulting uh, ribbons that are made from sectioning and then permanently mounting them. So once we have the section slide, uh, slides, we place them in a series of chemicals and stains. Uh, this is so that we can color certain parts of the gonads, specifically the sperm and the eggs, so that we can observe them under the microscope. Um, the, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, there are several different boxes containing different chemicals and stains and different steps. Uh, we use a chemical called hemp, hematoxylin uh, to dye the DNA of the sperm a dark purple. And then we also use a different stain called eosin, which binds, the, uh, binds to the yolk of the egg and creates this kind of dark reddish magenta. So the slides themselves are uh, placed in chemicals that kind of set the, uh, set the slides, stain them, and then they're also rinsed out underwater. The process itself takes about 40 minutes as we transfer them to box to box. Um, and at the end, the slides are stained so that we can see the contrast between the eggs, the sperm, and the rest of the uh, gonad. Um, 
we then use a strong glue to place a sheet of uh, thin glass to secure the gonad on the slide uh, so that we can then place them under microscopes and make sure that the, uh, the tissue of the gonad does not get affected as we place them under the microscope. Thank you, very good. Um, and now, last but not least, certainly, we have Ilyan Qureshi, and he's a four-year veteran of this program, starting, I believe, uh, on, at age 11. And he lives in Link Lincoln, Mass, and is entering his freshman year at the Moses Brown School in Providence. And he's going to illustrate how we use microscopy to evaluate the spawning status of each scallop uh, that we've collected, and every single scallop is, is uh, given a spawning status based on this, because it's really the only way that you can be sure uh, when, if, and to what degree the scallop has spawned throughout the summer. Uh, and Ilion will then end by giving you what we hope are the major outcomes of our summer research and mentoring program. Ilion? Uh, hi, Val, thank you. Uh, so microscopy is the act of taking a piece of specimen and dyeing it in ink and looking at it through a microscope. Uh, when using, you can you use a microscope to determine whether the sample is either partially spawned, fully spawned, or is starting to spawn. Yeah, there's also the how ripe the ovary and testes are. Uh, halfway through the spawning, uh, uh, there are a couple different pictures. For example, when it's before spawn. The ovary is kind of like clumped up in a darker bit. And then the testes are more of, uh, are, the testes are also right next to it. it I'm sorry, I messed up. Uh, <laughs> You're doing fine, Ilion. I'm sorry, I messed, I messed up and I just, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, that's fine. No problem. So there's a group of people. In fact, isn't that you, Ilion, in that picture? Yes. No. <laughs> Not this year, a couple of years ago. Yeah. And that's Faison a couple of years ago. So, yeah. But you can see from the pictures what uh, the different stages are. And this uh, uh, Sastry is somebody back from the, uh, he was at University of Rhode Island. Uh, back in the 60s and he's considered one of the fathers of scallop biology in any case. So um, this is the outcomes. Did you wanna say anything about this slide, Ilion? Uh, yes. Uh, overall the past couple of years, working with Val and her being a mentor has been very fun. I've learned all about scallops that I would not known otherwise. Being able to collect, dissect, and study scallops has enlarged my education on the ocean and how scallops live. And I thank Val and I look forward to working with her in the future. Thank you, Ilion. Um, and I'm just really glad that I, it's a lot of teamwork and a lot of students teaching each other, which really, to me, is very satisfying to see happening. Uh, and that's, to me, as important as mastering the, the biology or the, the techniques that we use. So I want to thank you all for coming and listening to our presentation. And I want to especially thank the Mariah Mitchell Association for uh, its generosity and giving us laboratory space and assistance whenever we need it. And our funding sources, the Great Harbor Yacht Club, the Shellfish Association, the Qureshi family, and the Soko family. And of course, our captain who was just so entertaining all the time, the kids just love going out with Carl. And, and thanks to Tara Riley, our shellfish biologist for the tours that all of them got to take to the hatchery. And I have a liaison to the Great Harbor Yacht Club Foundation Board, Karen Ketterer, her son is in the program. And my research assistants, I, would, I was so happy to have you three working. Um, at various times during the summer, and all of you dedicated volunteers, and I'm so very proud of all of you, and I would be happy to have you back if ever you want to come back, and uh, you're an intelligent, motivated, and capable group of young people, and you've learned a lot. I've seen you learn it throughout the summer, and um, you know, you could, if you came back, you would probably be ready to teach it to a brand new group of kids coming through. 
So you should also be very proud of yourselves. And thank you again, all of you for coming. And uh, I'll, it's great to have you. And it means a lot to me and to my students uh, that you're here listening to us. Are there any questions in that Q&A? Yeah, well, um, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple questions and I'll encourage everyone in the audience, if you have any questions, now is a great time to send them in. Um, so our first question, where do the students do all of this work? And is it reported to other science centers like Woods Hole? Should I answer? I guess maybe, well, does anyone wanna say where we do our work? <laughs> Um, if you're familiar with the Mariah Mitchell Association, we're in the front, in a little front room of the um, Hinchman House, uh, which they allow, uh, let us have as a laboratory. And, um, and other than that, we're out in the field with Carl and his uh, commercial scalloping boat. And we are uh, in the process of uh, getting the, that pea crab uh, paper published, we hope. And we have gone over to Woods Hole two or three times in different summers. And uh, not so much for sharing our work, but for learning. Um, and we've had some articles in the newspaper from time to time. And Mariah Mitchell have, has published some things from time to time about the program. Uh, we have a comment also. Looks like some of the cross sections turned out to resemble Nantucket. Very oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess I was yeah, on the right same there. slides. <laughs> oh, good. You know, you noticed that. Yes, the uh, face on the, the, the young man above was the one who pointed those out to me. And of course, as far as a cross section of a scallop, the gonad, those weren't very great. But the fact that they looked like Nantucket, we probably should have stained them just to just for fun. <laughs> um, the next question or a comment first, great presentations. For any of the presenters during field work and lab work, is there a test or a step that is particularly difficult for you? Uh, I could answer that question. Uh, thank you, Andrew. So uh, my, uh, the most difficult part and my least favorite part um, is definitely dissecting just because the scallops uh, had been harvested the day before. So they were a day old. Uh, there was a, not the best smell especially because I, I love eating scallops, but the, the uh, smell of old scallops definitely was not appetizing. And um, we, were, uh, we would have to thread the needle um, in a bunch of uh, old salt water and mixture of guts from the scallops. So that was definitely the hardest part, but it is one of the most important parts, so. I can also answer that question. Um, I think what I found difficult, but also kind of enjoyable, I guess, is the sectioning part of things where it would take a very long time to, actually the slide is up right now, to get the machines set up where that you can section clean blocks. But once you do, that's probably my favorite part, but it takes a while to get to that part, to get to that stage. Okay, if no one else wants to go, I have another question from Georgia. Do classic scallops also have growth rings that tell how old they are, or is it only nub scallops? Anyone want to answer that? Um, I can answer it. Um, the classic scallops also have, um, they do have growth rings as well, but typically um, on the nub scallops, it'll be up like, right near the the very top um and then with the the classics it'll be a little further down because they had more time to grow before uh it got colder and they stopped growing um but usually to to feel a growth ring by the way you have to like pull uh pull it with your fingernail go down with your fingernail down the scallop it makes a very unpleasant noise um but you have to do that because a lot of scallops also have like rings of coloration that you could possibly mistake for a growth ring. Excellent, thank you for that answer. Um, our next question, 
can we now predict whether better spawn will yield a better crop of scallops? Anybody want to take a guess at that? Um, it's a little hard, but you'd have to wait two years from, you know, if you had a good spawn, you, you'd have to wait two years to see the result of that spawn. And there are a lot of things that can happen between in those, you know, in those two years. It could give you some idea, I would think. What do you guys think? <laughs> All right, thanks, Val. The next question, are students able to add their names to the research publications? Oh, yes, it, if I, I can answer that, yes. In fact, uh, the PCRAB paper that's out for uh, review uh, is uh, the first author is uh, a student, well, a college grad who was my research assistant last year, and she's the first author. Oh, yeah, I, I very strongly believe that students should students' names should be on papers and maybe even be first authors if they're the ones who wrote the paper. That's awesome, that's really powerful. Um, our next question, is there any research being done on Cape Cod? Let's see. There was work, somebody was doing work about uh, with the aquaculture of bay scallops at, at the at Woods Hole a while back. I don't know if he still is. is. And but down at Milford, Connecticut, there's a, a fishery lab that is doing genetics of bay scallops, including the uh, shell genetics, you know, we're getting the different patterns of the shells, like the, the white stripes or the mottled appearance, or whether you get white shells versus orange shells, things like that. But uh, they do it through molecular uh, means with DNA, but I don't, I can't think of anything else. Hmm. All right, next we have a comment. Great to meet such intelligent and interested students. <laughs> Al Hall is doing wonderful research with the students. It's very nice. Um, our next question, are any of our presenters interested in studying marine science in college? Um, I would say that I, think that I'd probably end up studying some something like that in college. So far, that's what I'm looking at going into. Uh, I guess I can answer as well. Uh, I haven't put too much thought to what I'm planning on studying, but uh, marine science is definitely one of the top ones that I will go into. Personally, I uh, joined this program because I was just interested in science in general, and I really wanted to see what it's like working in a lab. But after this past summer, I really enjoyed the uh, my experience going out on these collecting trips and really going out into the field. So I definitely think that marine science is something that I'll consider in the future. All right, we have another comment saying congratulations on amazing work. Thank you, Val. Mm -hmm. um, we have another comment. Great presentation, everyone. For the presenters, is there anything that you learned while doing this research that really surprised you? Yeah, so this was talked about a little bit earlier, but it's really amazing just how many factors are affecting the scallops and how much has to actively be managed in order to conserve the population. I didn't realize that there were so many different variables that researchers had to look into and then had to, you know, try to convince local authorities to take action on. I found that very surprising. Um, I was surprised that Nantucket is one of like the last places with base scallops. I did not know that they were like so limited. I just kind of thought that they were everywhere because on Nantucket, I feel like I see the shells everywhere, but I guess they're not everywhere anywhere else.
All right, thank you for those answers. Um, the next question, what is the economic importance of bay scallops on Nantucket or about how much money does harvesting generate? I don't know if we know that one, but we'd have to ask our Captain Carl. I wish he was with us tonight, but as he's one of the few that seems to be out there all winter long. It's not the way it used to be because the harvest is so small now. I mean, back in the 70s and 80s, they were getting 100,000 bushels from the harbor, and now they're getting like, oh, less than 10,000 bushels in a season that goes from November 1st to the end of March, although most, most people don't make it that long. Uh, so I don't know. I, I mean, now I don't think it's the kind of living they could have used to make, that they used to make out of uh, from base scalloping. I think it's more of, you know, a supplemental income for some people. They can't, they can't live on it, unfortunately. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, given what you've learned about water temperature, what is your prediction for the effect on our scallop population? Oh. Faison, you wanna take a stab at that? <laughs> Sure, I will. One sec. Um, what is your prediction for the effect on our scallop population? Um, so, the scallop population in in the uh, recent years has has definitely been going down, and with our current trends, um, uh, in my opinion, the scallop population will continue to go down. But with a um, more restrictions on on harvesting and um, with more restrictions on pollution, I definitely think that the uh, the downwards curve may eventually flatten. But um, in my opinion, uh, not anytime uh, soon in the next couple of years. Yeah. All right, and with that, there was another question mentioning um, Bradley had submitted this. I often find pea crabs in mussels as well. Are they a problem that would pea should be addressing? I could give some, I could do, I could probably get, get that answer. Uh, animals that are more sessile than scallops, that is that they're more stuck to the bottom, like oysters and mussels, they tend to be uh, parasitized by pea crabs more than bay scallops. Bay scallops have the um, the adaptation to be able to swim. And so they can get rid of pea crabs when the pea crabs are small. So we don't find as many of them uh, as we do in mussels, for example. So it is a big problem, but I don't know who is studying it. Uh, but my, my uh, research assistant from last Sunday, uh, last summer, um, Mackenzie Welch, who I think is listening on his, to this, would know the answer to that. <laughs> Uh, the next question, do you look at gamey quality or just presence and absence? What is that? Could you repeat that? Yeah, I might have pronounced it wrong. Do you look at gamete, G-A-M-E-T-E, -E, quality or just presence and absence? Gamete quality. I can answer that question. Um, so when we're doing microscopy, we're looking uh, very closely at both the ovaries and testes. So when we're looking at that, we're looking at both. Um, we're mainly looking at the absence or presence of eggs and sperm in these uh, gonads, but I know personally, I have found several scallops in which uh, the eggs themselves are misshapen and begin to break down. I know Val can tell me the name of that condition, but we will note when the quality is affected within the uh, scallop. Oh, that's right. You're the, uh, the those were, yeah, that's atresia. Those are atresic eggs, which eggs, those are eggs that for some reason or another uh, will never be spawned, whether it's because of starvation in the scallop or disease or what, we don't really know. Uh, but yeah, that, 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 that is, that's a great answer, Kay. All right, we have one more comment and one more question, it looks like. So the comment is great presentations. Um, and the next question, which is our last one right now, other than warming waters, will climate change impact the base scallops in other ways? 
So uh, I can answer that question. So um, climate change will definitely, um, the biggest effects will be rising in water levels and severe, more severe um, weather other than um, uh, change in temperature. And um, both of those, the rise in water level will definitely change the habitats of the scallops. Um, so scallops when they're reproducing and when they're living their adult life will definitely have to adapt to that. And uh, with more severe weathers, um, same thing, uh, scallops will definitely have to adapt to um, more severe water currents. And uh, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? There, there is one, I mean, that the, the more, the warmer the water gets, uh, the, the northern migration of uh, species like the green crab uh, and other invasive species, the more northerly they become in their range and that adversely affects the base scallop because uh, it's a predator of the base scallop and also harmful algal blooms like the rust tide and other uh, and some of the red tides will have also migrated northward because of uh, climate change. So it's an indirect effect. All right, thank you, Val. Um, I think that was actually our last question. Um, so thank you to the audience for submitting so many great questions. And thank you to Val and all your students for answering those great questions and for that awesome presentation. I really feel like I learned a lot and it was so meaningful that it came from everyone that participated. So that's, that's really great. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you again for presenting. Thank you all for joining us here this evening for the Mariah Mitchell Association Science Speaker Series. Um, it hasn't been announced yet, but I do believe we have another presentation next week. So you can tune in same time, same place for another Science Speaker Series lecture. And thank you and have a great night. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, students. Thank you, Val.